Uh, today, uh, we're going we're gonna to take a, a little interaction uh, in the book of Mark. This is, we're going to jump into Mark chapter 2, and like Nate had said, Barry's going to go back and kind of uh, give us some of the context and the backstory of Mark uh, next week. Uh, but what we, what we see here is we see uh, in this passage where great physical need collide with great spiritual need. And uh, when I was a number of years ago, uh, I had an opportunity to go on a missions trip. Uh, this missions trip was to Mexico. Uh, probably many of us have been on uh, similar trips. Uh, this was just uh, to Ensenada, so not real far down into Mexico. And uh, this trip, the, the goal of this trip was to uh, provide some medical needs uh, for these people. And uh, I was a, a young boy or a younger boy, and I was a high school kid. And so I, I'm on this medical trip with no real medical knowledge. I was CPR trained, but uh, you wouldn't want me fixing your tooth or anything like that. And uh, so I'm on this trip with this team, and, and we're, we're going into these little parts of town, and we're seeing this incredible need for medicine, uh, this incredible need for the physical healing of somebody's body. Uh, as we were on this trip, I remember seeing uh, folks come in with uh, like real extreme abscesses on, on their teeth uh, or real extreme burns on their arms. And I can remember as, uh, as, as I was on this trip thinking, how, how can I help these people? Like, what, it, what, what am I here for? And we, we kind of unroll this big tent and uh, this trailer. And my job on this trip was to be part of the team who then prayed for these people as they went and got their, their different, their teeth fixed or their hands looked at or uh, an infection looked at. And as they came through and they got worked on, then they got to come over to me and, and another small team and we got to ask them if they had prayer requests or we got to ask them if they, if they knew Jesus. And uh, on this trip, I saw this incredibly hurting people physically and also these incredibly hurting people spiritually, both be, be able to be more well. Now, we didn't always get to fix all their physical needs, but they had the opportunity to have their spiritual needs taken care of through Jesus Christ. Uh, today, we're going to see in Mark chapter 2, uh, Jesus, uh, right in front of him, this incredible physical need collide with an incredible spiritual need. Let me pray for us. Uh, before we read the passage. Father, we, we love you. Lord, we pray now as we read your word and as we teach it, Lord, that you would make it clear to us. Lord, that you would convict us uh, in, in our lives right now, that you would help us to look more uh, like Jesus, like your son. Father, I, uh, I pray as, uh, as I attempt to teach this passage that you would uh, speak through me, that your words would be clear, uh, that, that it wouldn't be me standing here, uh, but it would be your words uh, to your people, God. Father, we, uh, we love you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. It says, a few days later, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it. And they lowered the mat the man was laying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that, that what, what, what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, take, I tell you, take up your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. 
This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. Starting in verse 1, we see where Jesus has come home. Uh, we see where Jesus has uh, made his home in Capernaum, uh, but, but he's come home from, from a time of, of ministry. And uh, we see in chapter 1 uh, where Jesus has, uh, has healed a number of people. He's called his first disciples. Uh, he's announced that he is God. Uh, and, and we see a few days later it says that he's come home. He's come home. This is, this is probably Peter's house. Uh, this is the house of one of his disciples. It's thought that maybe Jesus made uh, his, his kind of headquarters there for about a year and a half. And so he lived with Peter. Uh, he stayed with Peter because we know that Jesus didn't have a house or a place to call his, his own. And it says that a few days later, uh, that this crowd starts to gather. This crowd starts to come around. And, uh, and, and I believe that this crowd starts to come around because what happened just a few days ago. We see where Jesus heals a man that has leprosy. Uh, this leper who, who was an outcast in society comes to Jesus and he's like, Master, if, if, you, could, if you could just... Heal me, touch me, make me clean uh, so I can go home and be with my family. And Jesus does. He, he, he interacts with this incredibly debilitating disease and he heals this man. He also tells this man, don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody what's happened here. And, uh, he's, and, and obviously this guy has gone around. He's talking freely. He's sharing with everybody that he is now home and he's clean and Jesus has healed him. So Jesus now is starting to kind of gather this following. And as he goes home, he's in Peter's house. It says that this, in, in verse 2, it says that they gathered in such large numbers, there was no room left in the house. So this crowd starts to kind of pack in. I'm just imagining being Peter at this point. Uh, you've invited, you've just been called to be a disciple of Jesus, and you've invited him to stay at your house, and now you have like a hundred house guests just coming to eat your food, to see what's in the fridge, uh, to make sure you've cleaned all the little corners, and there's this group of people that have now gathered and, uh, and, and it says that th there were so many, there was no room left inside, and they were even spilling out the door. So this is a large crowd. Uh, it's believed that, that many of the houses at this time, like you could have packed in maybe 50 people into this kind of great room. And uh, so we got 50 people maybe packed into the great room and then a large spill out around the house, probably people trying to look in the windows, just trying to like get a glimpse of Jesus. And, uh, and what's awesome here is we see where Jesus, as this crowd gathers, it says Jesus preaches the word to them. Uh, Jesus immediately starts to teach he starts to teach his words. Uh, we don't know what he's teaching. We don't know if he's, you know, teaching an Old Testament passage or maybe if he's telling them about how he is the son of man. Uh, but he starts teaching. And, uh, and, and this is a great reminder for us that, that the teaching of God's word should be prominent on our lips. We should be, that should be the first thing we go to when we have people in front of us. We should want to teach them about who God is, what he's doing. And so Jesus starts to preach. He starts to preach so this crowd would know exactly who he is. And then in verse 3, we see some of them came bringing a paralyzed man, and it was carried by four. So we don't know. This man's paralyzed. Uh, we know that that probably means that his legs don't work. It could mean that his upper body doesn't work. We're not really sure uh, if he's just a paraplegic, quadriplegic, if he just can't walk, uh, what's happening here. But he obviously needs help coming to Jesus. I can just imagine these four friends thinking to themselves, they've heard. They've heard that Jesus has healed a number of people. That he's even healed leprosy. And uh, these four friends getting together and like, okay, I got a plan. Let's get, let's get them to Jesus. Let's get our friend that can't walk to Jesus. And, 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 and I can just like, hey, we're going to carry him. We're going to show up there. Uh, we're going we're gonna to do our best to get him right in front of Jesus. And Jesus is going to heal him. 
Jesus is going to take care of his physical need. And these four men load up the paralytic on the, man, on the mat. And they start walking. We don't know how far they, they journeyed. I kind of imagine that they maybe had to journey a, a little ways. Uh, because by the time they get there, the house is full and spilling out. Uh, so either that or they just were really bad with time. And uh, so they, they are they're now walking up to this house where they've heard Jesus is going to be. And... Maybe they're late. Maybe they just, they just didn't make it in time. And they see this crowd of people around. They see this crowd of people outside of the house. And I kind of imagine they, they stop from a little further back. And they maybe set them down. And they're like, guys, what are we going to do? Like team huddle. And uh, they come around. How, do we go home? Do we, do we just stop? Maybe Jesus will come out of the house and we can like call him over. Come here, Jesus, come take care of my friend. And they have this like team huddle between the five of them. And I have a feeling someone goes, let's get him to Jesus. One of the friends is like, don't give up. Let's get him to Jesus somehow. So they continue along their journey. They get to the house. It's packed. A quick note here. The people in the house... They didn't turn around and say, hey, get your friend in. They were so worried about themselves seeing Jesus, seeing and hearing uh, Jesus, uh, maybe wanting to see a miraculous sign or wonder. Uh, they weren't actually worried about anybody else coming up behind them. And, uh, and, and so now they come up, the friends holding this man, and they say, we got a plan. There's too many people here. Let's get up on the roof. Let's get up on the roof of this house because of the crowd. So houses in these days were about, sing they were single story homes, uh, probably, and they would have had flat roofs. Uh, and with this flat roof, they probably would have had a stairway or a ladder on the side of the house on the outside. So a little different than our houses where we uh, maybe have a balcony, but you can only access it from the inside. Uh, they had a balcony that you could access from the outside. These balconies would have been uh, used uh, probably for, for bathing. They would have been used as like a deck. Uh, they maybe would have been slept on. Uh, so they would have been like an extension of the family home, uh, but on the outside of the house. And uh, so these men somehow were able to get to the ladder or to get to the stairway, and they get their friend up on the roof. They're up on the roof, and they say, let's dig a hole. Let's dig a hole in the roof, and let's get him down to Jesus. Uh, it's interesting as we see that, that this man is lowered directly to Jesus. I kind of see them like huddling up and maybe like listening really carefully. Okay, where, where is he talking from? Can we, can we get right over the top of Jesus? Uh, or can, or can, we, can we get to where he just like comes right in front of Jesus and nobody, it can't be avoided? And, and they're, they're listening on the roof, figuring out where they're going to dig. And uh, their, their roofs were a little different than ours. They weren't composite shingles or like here, like a metal roof. Uh, they, were, they were made of, of mud and thatch and maybe some, some hard clay tiles. And so they find this place where they're going to dig, and they start digging through this roof. We don't know if they use tools, or maybe they, they like just got, a, got one of the tiles out of the way, and they start digging, and, uh, and, and they start to go down, and I can just maybe see like one of their eyes looking in to Jesus. Like looking down, like, yep, this is the right spot. Now imagine you're in the house, and you see this commotion going on. You see, uh, you see this distraction. Jesus is preaching the word. You're expecting to see this sign or wonder, this miracle maybe that, that Jesus is going to do, and dirt starts falling on your head. Uh, you start to see this dust cloud. Maybe Jesus is like choking on a little bit of dust or whatever it might be, and, and, and he just keeps preaching, and these guys just keep digging. They, uh, they dig through the first layer of mud, and, uh, and they, they make a hole large enough to lower this man through. We don't know how big that hole would be, uh, but if the man was as big as me, it would be a big hole. Uh, and they lowered him through, maybe a four-foot hole or something like that, and uh, they lower him directly through, directly to Jesus. As they're lowering him, I can just see the four friends 
maybe with big smiles on their face, maybe a little bit like a youth group team building event where they're like, don't, don't drop them. Okay, let's lower together. Let's, let's all lower at the same time so he doesn't fall off the mat. Remember, he can't land on his feet. And uh, so he's getting lowered. He's getting lowered. And, uh, and, and I kind of picture that he gets all the way to the ground. And the friends now are looking down at Jesus. They're looking down at Jesus, and the man is laying on the floor on his mat, and they're wondering, okay, Jesus, what are you going to do? What are you going to say? The people around are looking at him. Uh, they're looking at Jesus, and maybe thinking, like, is now the time we're going to see him do something miraculous? Is now the time he's going he's gonna, to, like, place his hands on this guy and heal this guy? And, uh, and I'm sure the paralytic's like, I just want to get out of here. I just, like... People have stared at me my whole life, and I'm an outcast in this community. I can't work. I can't take care of my family. I just want to leave. I I, I want people's eyes to not be on me. And if if I could leave walking out of this room, that would be amazing. And he's laying there. And I kind of see it where the crowd goes silent for a minute. And in verse 5, it says, When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. I'm sure the friends at that point, the friends at that point were like, Jesus, can you not see what he needs? The, par- the paralytic man's like, I guess I'm not walking out of here. Uh, and, and they're like, what do, we, what do we do from here? But it says when Jesus saw their faith, he spoke to them. He spoke to him. He calls him Son. He, he doesn't say sir, he calls him son. It's a term of endearment. It's a term of somebody that he, that he loves. Son, your sins are forgiven. In this moment, Jesus speaks to the man's greatest need. And that was that his sins would be forgiven. That his sins would be taken away. In verse 6. We see now some teachers of the law were sitting there, and they were thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? The teachers of the law. So we now see another character, another group of people come on to the scene. Uh, if, If we look at other parts of the gospel where this account is mentioned, we see where it's Pharisees, and we see where it's probably scribes. Uh, so that we have the teachers of the law and the keepers of the law, but it's the religious folks sitting here. It's interesting that the religious folks get to sit in front of Jesus. We have this crowd flocking to him, religious folks sitting there, and a guy getting lowered through the roof. You would think that the religious people, the people that, that know the laws, that maybe are supposed to be close with God, would have gotten up and done something. Would have gotten up and said, hey, why don't you have my seat? Or, hey, bring your friend over this way. But they weren't worried about that. They were worried about making sure that they looked good. Making sure that they kept all the laws. And making sure that Jesus, this guy that they started to hear about, is not breaking any of the religious rules. Jesus says, son, your sins are forgiven. And immediately they don't go, wow, this guy's God. Wow, this guy, this guy really is God. He, he's claiming to forgive sin. It says that they, that they started thinking to themselves, why does he talk like that? Like, who does this guy think he is, is basically what they're saying. Uh, he, he's, he's not really God. He's not really the Messiah. Why would he talk like this? And, and, and then they said, you know what, he's blaspheming. He's claiming to be God. At that point, Jesus, by, by forgiving sins, by saying, son, your sins are forgiven, he has just told the crowd and he's told the religious people, I am God. I am the Messiah, and I have the ability to forgive sins. They knew that only God alone had the ability to forgive sins, and Jesus speaks right to that. Who can forgive sins but God alone? These religious people, even even in the midst of someone's sins being forgiven, they weren't willing to worship and know who the one true God was. In verse 8, it says, Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit what, that, that 
what it was that they were thinking in their hearts. So Jesus, uh, he, he's God. Uh, Jesus knows what they're thinking. Uh, Jesus can, can, can understand what they're thinking, and, and he knows exactly what's going on in this religious, uh, these religious people's minds uh, and, and, and in their hearts. And Jesus speaks right to him. He says, why are you thinking these things? As a religious person, I would think that they would have been blown away at that point. They would have said, well, hold up. Maybe he's on to something. Maybe he really is this God that he's claiming to be. And then he tells them, which is easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, take up your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So Jesus, he's like, what's easier? He's like, religious people, uh, I know what you're thinking. You, now you know I know what you're thinking. You have to know that I'm God. And he says, what, what's easier for me to say? Your sins are forgiven or to, to walk? And uh, from our perspective, as we think about this passage, uh, from an earthly perspective, it would have been way easier for Jesus to just say your sins are forgiven. From an earthly perspective, it would have been way easier for me to go, hey, Cheyenne, your sins are forgiven. And, and then Cheyenne just continues to sit there. There's no like red dot that starts shining or a halo that glows over her head. And, and she can just go about her daily walk, her daily business. That's what Jesus said to this guy, your sins are forgiven. There's no immediate proof. He didn't all of a sudden like start glowing or anything like that. It would have been way easier for Jesus just to say, your sins are forgiven. It's done. It's over. And, and Jesus says, what's easier? Your sins are forgiven or to take up your mat and go home? From an earthly perspective, uh, or for, sorry, from a heavenly perspective, we know what the cost of our sin is. We know what the cost of forgiveness is. We know that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. So from the heavenly perspective, what Jesus did is way harder. What Jesus did uh, shows his authority because he forgives the man's sin. Jesus then goes, but I want you to know. I want you to know that I am who I say I am, that I really am the Son of Man, and that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins so he says to the man, he looks at him, he says, I tell you, take up your mat and go home. Jesus, when he calls himself the son of man, Jesus is calling himself God. Jesus is, is using a familiar term to call himself God. And, and he actually uses this term for himself like something like 18 or 19 times throughout the book of Mark. And something like 80 times Throughout the gospel, Jesus is called the Son of Man. The Son of Man means that he is God in human. That he's God in human form. And that's what Jesus is claiming for himself. That I am God, I am the Messiah, and I'm here walking with you. It's so important that we understand that. It's so important because the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, they didn't get it. They didn't get and understand that Jesus came to earth as God and as human to die for their sins. They missed it completely. And, and I believe that there's people in our culture that miss it in the same way. Jesus is a good person. He was a good guy. Yeah, maybe he was a prophet. Uh, it's so important for us to know that Jesus is the son of man that is talked about in Scripture. Verse 11, he tells him, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Jesus gives him uh, three quick commands. Uh, he looks at him, he looks at this man, he's like, so you can know that I really am who I say I am, that I really am the Son of Man, that I really am God, that I really can't forgive your sins. I'm going to show you in a physical way. And he tells him, get up. This is a paralyzed man. This is a paralyzed man. This takes a little bit of faith for this man to stand up now, to get up. Like, is this really going to happen, or am I going to lay here on this mat and look dumb? And uh, he gets up, he picks up his mat, and he walks out of the room. Uh, it says that he got up, he took his mat, and he walked out in full view of all of them. 
So Jesus, after he gives them these commands, he does exactly as Jesus tells him to do. He gets up, he takes his mat, and he goes home. I can just imagine what this man must have been feeling. He just got lowered through a roof in front of lots of people. He's been maybe feel, felt embarrassed his whole life. He said people stare at him his whole life. Now Jesus has come on the scene. He's forgiven his sins. He took care of his most important need that his sins would be forgiven. And then he heals his body physically. And he tells him to walk out. It's interesting that he's able to walk out, but he wasn't able. His friends weren't able to have him walk in. I can just see all these people in this house all like step aside. You know, we're going to just let him walk right out the front door. And he walks out in full view of these people. And it says that this amazed everyone and they praised God. They said, we've never seen anything like this. So as this man walks out, as this man walks out, he, the people that are in this place, it says that they praise God. It says that they, that they, that they, they're in, in awe of who he is. And uh, they praise God and they say, it's interesting, they didn't say, like, praise the King of Kings or praise God. They said, we've never seen anything like this. Like, this is, this is weird, is kind of what they said. Uh, we, we don't really understand what happened here. They didn't actually praise God for who he is. They just praised God saying, like, it's never been done like this before. I'm not really sure what happened? This, this crowd is amazed. And I think the response is a little bit off. Just a little bit off in saying we've never seen anything like this. Now I believe that there's probably some that glorified God and praised him. Uh, but we also know that later on as Jesus heals people, they don't praise God. They take their coats off and they grab rocks and they try to stone them. Uh, they grab rocks and they try to kill him. So obviously the people aren't completely getting it here. In this passage we see, uh, we see this great need of sin being forgiven and this great need of a body being fixed collide. And we see four groups of people here. I kind of want to interact with these four groups for a minute. Uh, but we see four groups in the story. We see the crowd. We see the crowd and they, they wanted to be around Jesus. They wanted to, to be kind of where Jesus was at. They maybe heard of some of the incredible things that Jesus was doing. I'm going to stop right there. I think that, that probably we will, we will kind of resonate with one of these four groups, maybe a couple of these groups. So I want you to think as I explain these different groups, uh, maybe which one, which one are you? Which one do you kind of fall into? Uh, and the first one's that crowd. The first one's the crowd. They want to be around Jesus. Uh, they, they maybe invite their friends to come, to come around Jesus, uh, to, to be close to Jesus. Uh, maybe they've heard that uh, he was doing some great things. Uh, but this crowd, uh, they, were, they were curious, but they weren't really Christ followers. They weren't really uh, there to, to look after uh, and to, to love each other and to care for each other's needs and to really understand who this Jesus was. They were kind of there. They were kind of there just to, just to see what good stuff was going on. I think sometimes we have people uh, in the church now that fall into that same crowd, that fall into that same group. Maybe we come to church because it's, we know it's a good thing. We know that we're supposed to do that. Uh, or, we, or we do religious things because that's what we were told we were supposed to do. That's what the Pharisees and the teachers of the law did. They did religious things because that's what they were told they had to do. Maybe we do these things. We come to church. Maybe we, we invite our friends because there's going to be a great band that's going to come and play or because there's an awesome speaker and he's going to tickle our ears. But we don't really come for the right reasons. Uh, we don't really, we just come because, because we're supposed to. Because it's kind of what Christians do, maybe. And, uh, and, 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 and I hope that if that's why we're here at church, that we can kind of evaluate our hearts and our lives. Why do, we, why do we come together? 
Why do we come together as a church? Are we just a crowd of people who's just curious and we're going to make sure, like the Pharisees, that he's doing the things that they're supposed to do and church is acting like it's supposed to act and we come as a crowd person? This crowd person, these crowd people, as they, as they left, they saw God, Jesus, do an incredible work. They saw Jesus do an incredible work right in front, not only the forgiveness of their sins, uh, and they also saw this, this body be healed. And it says that they left amazed. Uh, and we're not sure exactly in that leaving amazed, but, but my hope and my prayer for our people here that maybe fall into that crowd is that when we leave this place, our lives would be all about Jesus. That we would be all about knowing Christ and making him known to the world. That we would truly live praising God. That we would truly leave wanting to know him more. So there's this crowd people. Maybe we resonate with that. There's also this religious skeptic is what I'm calling them. Uh, these are the scribes. These are the teachers of the law. They, they come in uh, to make sure that Jesus doesn't break the rules. They come in making sure Jesus keeps all the rules and they want to keep everybody straight. These are like the, the fundamentalists that, that want to make sure that our church make, keeps all the rules and does everything exactly how it's supposed to be and there's no tradition broken. That's what these people did. They, they, wanted to, they didn't really want to understand who Jesus was, uh, but they wanted to make sure that everything stayed the same, that, that the rules were kept and I'm going to make rules so we don't break the rules. And maybe that religious skeptic kind of resonates with us. Uh, I know that sometimes that's, that's, how, that's the one I resonate with in my heart. Someone that's grown up in church my whole life. And uh, church is supposed to be done a certain way, at a certain time, you wear a certain thing, and, and I become this religious skeptic. I become this Pharisee. Uh, I become this fundamentalist that just wants to make sure it's done the right way. That's what these people were. And they left they left understanding that Jesus was God. Jesus immediately knew what they thought in their heart, and he let them know that. They understood that Jesus was God, and hopefully if we're following that religious skeptic, that Pharisee, that we would leave here knowing and understanding the work and the power of the Holy Spirit and that Jesus is God. There was also the, the paralyzed man. Uh, there, was, there was this man, this, this, this man that had to be brought to Jesus. He had this great physical need. He also had this great spiritual need. Maybe that's, maybe that's where we're at. Maybe, maybe we have this need for, for Jesus, this ultimate need to know who he is. Maybe you're here and you don't know Jesus. Maybe you haven't given your life to Jesus fully, and, and you're like this paralytic that needs to be lowered in front of Jesus, and you need your sins to be forgiven. This paralyzed man, he left. Not only did he leave with his body fixed, but he left with his heart fixed. He left in right relationship with God Almighty. Maybe that's you. Maybe today is the day you leave with a right relationship with God Almighty. We also see the four friends. So real quick, we have the crowd, the religious skeptic, the paralyzed man, and we have the four friends. These four friends, these four friends were willing to do whatever it took to get their friend in front of Jesus. They were willing to do whatever, they t whatever action needed to happen. They took extreme action with great faith to get their friend in front of Jesus. I think there's something we can learn from this. So often in, in our culture, in our American culture, we don't want to be offensive. We don't want to be seen as pushy. We don't want to be seen as, uh, as somebody that's going to be a, maybe a Bible thumper or a preacher of the word or whatever it might be. But these four friends said, you know what, it's so important that my friend comes before Jesus. I'm going to do whatever. I'm going to do whatever it takes. I am going to go to extreme measure and action. Maybe we need to learn from that. Maybe we need, that needs to be us as we interact with our friends or we interact with our acquaintances uh, or we interact with people in the workplace. We need to be willing to say and do extreme things to bring our friends to Jesus. 
Sometimes we're not willing to do that. It's interesting. These four friends, they left. They did extreme measures. They probably could have been seen as outcasts. Maybe one of them is on Peter's roof fixing it after. Uh, hopefully, that would be the right thing to do, right? Uh, but, they, but they left. They didn't leave with a friend still broken. When their friend came to Jesus, they left with a friend that had been healed, that had had an interaction with Christ. And not only did their physical needs get met, but their spiritual needs get left get met. We need to be willing to be like these friends. I have a few applications or exhortations from this passage as we, as we come to a close here. Uh, hopefully, uh, this passage has been a great reminder of the actions that we need to take f- for people to come to know Christ. The first, uh, the first exhortation or application I have for us is that we need to live lives bringing people to Jesus. I want you to think, when's the last time you shared Christ with somebody in your life? When's the last time you shared the gospel with somebody in your life? If you, if you have to think a long ways back, we're not following this passage. If you have to think a long ways to think about, I don't know, I don't know the last time I actually shared Christ with somebody. We have some work to do. We need to live lives bringing people to Jesus. These men not only did everything they could, they were creative in how they did it. They put them on a stretcher and they drug them in through the roof, dropped them in front of Jesus. They were creative in how they did it. They were also sacrificial in how they did it, how they brought their friend to Jesus. They used their time and their resources. They, they, probably, they probably lowered him through the roof using the belt off of their jacket to get him to Jesus. And uh, so they were sacrificial in how they did it. They didn't just look back and say, well, today's not the day. Now's not the time. I'm going to do whatever I can to bring my friend to Jesus. And they did it full of faith. They, di- they brought their friend to Jesus. They lived this life, uh, at least in this moment, bringing their friend to Jesus full of faith. They were willing to rip the roof off to bring their friend to Jesus. Do we, do we live lives bringing people to Jesus? Do we live lives telling people about the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ? Do we live lives that are willing uh, to maybe step on somebody's toes to tell them about Jesus? If not, we have some work to do. The second exhortation or application I have is Jesus' love was evident in how they loved each other. Jesus' love was evident in how they loved and cared for each other. These four men, it was, it's very evident. It's very clear how much they loved and cared for their friend. They were willing to go to, like I said, extreme measures to bring their friend to Jesus. It was evident. It was, it was, it was foremost in their lives. I, w- I want to steal a term from, from a pastor that I heard speak on this very topic many years ago. I was in high school. I was a sophomore in high school. And, uh, and he called these four men stretcher bearers. He, called, he actually wrote a book on it. His name is Mike Slater. It's really good. Um, and, and, and Mike calls these guys stretcher bearers. He, and and he, he breaks it down. Are you a stretcher bearer for anybody else? And who are your stretcher bearers? These men, their love for each other was so evident that they were willing to carry each other's burdens with each other. So application number two, does does your love for others show that you're willing to carry their stretcher? Does your love for each other, for somebody else, show that they might be willing to carry your stretcher? I want you to take a moment. I want you to take a moment and think, if, if, if life's worst happened right now, who would be standing by your side? If life's worst happened right now, who would be standing there? Do you have folks? Do you have folks that you would be grabbing that stretcher and taking them to Jesus? And, and then, are you a stretcher bearer for somebody else? If life's worst some, 
happen to somebody else, are you there? Are you there willing to grab the handle and take that person to Christ? To take that person to meet their needs. Maybe it's physical, maybe it's spiritual. Are you a stretcher bearer? Are you, who are your stretcher bearers? I, uh, I, I believe that if we're loving and caring for people the way that Jesus has called us to love and care for people, we will have those people in our lives and we will be those people for others. So exhortation number two, have your love be evident that you care for others. And then the third exhortation from this passage is rejoice and praise God for his mighty work. We see uh, in the end here, they rejoice, they praise God. We don't know exactly to the extent they praised God, but when we see God work in our lives or in the lives of our friends, do we take time to celebrate? We should. We totally should. We should take time to rejoice what God is doing. At Jeunesse Park, at the end of every week, they take time to rejoice the new salvations by ringing a bell. These kids walk forward, they say, hey, my name's Jimmy and I'm from some other church down the valley. And they ring the bell. And they ring the bell and they rejoice and the camp cheers and the, the camp staff stops and, and watches what's going on there. And they rejoice in the work that Jesus has done in these kids' lives. Are you, are you someone who rejoices? Yeah, actually, Tony texted me like seven times asking me, who rang the bell? Any kids ring the bell? She was so excited, uh, wanting to know how many kids, there was 18 kids the week that we were at camp that rang the bell, and we should praise God for that. Uh, and there should be one more, 19, because she told me on Wednesday. So do we rejoice? Do we rejoice in the work that Jesus has done, not only in our lives, but in the lives of others? In this passage, we've seen this collision of great physical need and a great spiritual need. And we see the working, not only of Jesus, but of these four friends being willing to bring their friend and go through extreme measures to bring their friend to Jesus. Let's follow that example today. Let's pray. Father, we, we love you. Lord, as we think about this passage, as we think about this account, this interaction with, with your son, Lord, we, we stand in awe. We stand in awe that your son would come to earth, that he would be the son of man, and that he would forgive our sins, that he would ultimately die on the cross, be buried and rose again in our place, that we could have eternal life. And we stand in awe that your son would be willing to do that, and we also stand in awe of these four friends that would do everything they could to bring their friend to Jesus. Follow, Father, I pray that we would follow these examples, that we would be people that would be willing to be stretcher bearers for the burdens and the needs of the lost around us. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray.